within patients who have cirrhosis. There are rapid progressors. There are slow progressors. There are going to be non-progressors who will live and die with cirrhosis and not of cirrhosis and have a, a different clinical outcome. And until we stratify these folks to define what their natural history and outcomes will be, we will be challenged in trying to tailor a one-size-fits-all approach. The reason for, I think, some of the, I don't want to say dissatisfaction, but some of the angst here is, is we really do have a therapeutic landscape moving in parallel with a diagnostic landscape, which is moving in parallel with a population-based screening and surveillance and, and education. And ultimately, these parallel roads will converge and we'll look back and say it all came together at a perfect moment in time and, and look what we accomplished. Hi, this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Next Tsunami podcast. Over the next few days, we are offering three conversations from episode 63, the second of our three-part year-end series. The episodes offer shortened conversations with our opinion leaders. This piece shares our entire conversation with Manal Abdelmalik on how we can make better use of old drugs to treat patients today and what drug development promises for our future. This conversation represents a candid, detailed discussion with a major opinion leader on a subject she discusses passionately. So, Sit back, listen, enjoy, learn. And when you're done, join the discussion on our LinkedIn and Facebook discussion groups. So this morning, and it's morning in the States, afternoon in England, we're here with our friend Manal Abdelmalik, who's been with us on the podcast several times this year. Manal, how are you this morning? Oh, good morning, Roger. How are you? I'm fine. It's a little chilly in Pennsylvania. How's it doing in North Carolina? A little chilly, but we got beautiful sunny weather this morning, so I'm all, I'm good. It's good. And Louise, good afternoon. How are you today? Good afternoon. It's dull here, and it's chilly. <laughs> For the weather forecast. Yeah, I think it's admirable the way the Brits can laugh about that kind of weather daily. At any rate, so, so this is the fourth, I think, in our series of ongoing converse, end of year conversations with friends of the podcast, where we're taking a look at different things that we've learned in 2021. We haven't prepared for these, which is kind of talking. We invited Manal to join us today. She came on podcast back in a really well listened to episode. And in fact, her personal conversation was also highly uh, downloaded on the question of what can we do today? with older drugs, older medications that are available, and then to lay that up against what do we see coming in the next couple of years, and how will all that fit together to the degree it will, as compared to a simple transition from A to B, is I think really a great topic for today. So, Manal, I can ask you two questions to get started, and then floor is yours. Have fun with it. You talked both in this podcast and in one of the talks that you gave, I believe, at ASLD, about the idea that, particularly for cirrhotic patients, the idea that we do not have new indicated drugs means that we can throw up our hands and say there is no drug therapy. Can you remind us a little bit of what it was that led you to realize that that issue was as urgent as it was? I think you talked on the podcast about a talk you gave where someone asked a question. And then where you see that today in terms of what the things we can be doing for cirrhotic patients and, and should be doing? Well, you know, the, the cirrhotic patient cohort is one in absolute need. I mean, this is a huge urgency, emergency. And I think if you talk to any hepatologist, they'll resonate the message that we are seeing more and more of our patients transition to cirrhosis more patients in need for liver transplantation and a higher incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma that I am experiencing now in my clinical practice than I recall 20 years ago. And when we talk about this epidemic, we're certainly seeing a larger driver of it be attributable to Nafold and Nash. So it speaks to the huge unmet need for therapies in this space. I had given a talk in reflecting about what the ideal treatment for Nafold and Nash is for cirrhosis. And it's really one that I believe one size will not fit all. Ultimately, the goal for my patients with cirrhosis is, is frankly, you get to a point where you realize that reversing 20, 30, 40 years of chronic injury is not going to be achievable. It's not going to be achievable in one year, two years, maybe even three or five years. The goal of reversing hepatic fibrosis may not be one that is readily tangible with the current endpoints that we have in the context context of ongoing clinical trials. If we approach the cirrhotic cohort such that we blunt a metabolic driver of disease 
and also combine that with a, a therapy that will attenuate the fibrogenic response to a metabolic driver, we can potentially keep patients stable. There is data that if you improve diabetes or you induce weight loss or you even manage the metabolic syndrome effectively, there is emerging data that just blunting metabolic drivers with therapies such as insulin sensitizing agents, statins, ACE inhibitors could potentially minimize or the risk of cirrhosis, cancer, and hepatic decompensation can even improve portal pressure. With that being said, if we were to take this cohort of patients with cirrhosis and even maintain stability by optimizing their metabolic drivers and potentially combining it with therapies that at the very least the data suggests that they attenuate fibrosis progression, maybe not complete regression, that would be a win because then we take a large cohort at risk and prevent the risk of decompensation. Now, with longer-term studies, we may see that more sensitive surrogate markers of disease are showing evidence of fibrogenic repair, but we're not quite there yet. You know, our our endpoints with histology are amazingly crude. They're insensitive. We have evidence emerging that other surrogate markers of disease, whether it be MR elastography, uh, VCTE, or even ELF score are informing these uh, clinically meaningful outcomes. And so I think these pathways of therapy and biomarker discovery are right now in parallel with each other. And I'm hopeful in the upcoming coming year or two that they will collide, that they can inform each other more so than they are doing now because they'll be more broadly validated in the context of therapeutic trials. But I think cirrhosis will be either a drug that that wows us with its effect on metabolism, inflammation, and fibrosis, or combining therapies together such that we can attenuate these drivers and, and hope that we maintain stability, at least in the early treatment endpoints and with longer clinical trials that move into phase three, then see the downstream effect on on um, minimizing hepatic decompensation. So one of the ideas in there that you didn't hear a lot about two years ago, but you hear a bunch about now, is the idea that we don't necessarily have to focus on a one-level reduction in fibrosis, but there are situations, this being one, but not the only one, where stasis is probably a good enough goal from where, in your mind, did that school of thinking start to emerge? It, it started to emerge in my clinical practice, even within the spectrum of cirrhosis, there's a heterogeneity. There are patients that I see who have cirrhosis that remain stable for a decade, and others that I see that have cirrhosis that develop tumors but don't get hepatic decompensation as their first manifestation, and others that I may see that look incredibly well compensated and six months to a year from now are awaiting transplantation. Our clinical experience speaks to the heterogeneity within cirrhosis in so much that it speaks to the heterogeneity that we're challenged with within NASH. This is where we will learn more in the upcoming year because clearly we're starting to see genetic risk factors that are informing these endpoints. And we will discover that even within patients who have cirrhosis, there are rapid progressors, there are slow progressors, there are going to be non-progressors who will live and die with cirrhosis and not of cirrhosis and have a, a different clinical outcome. And until we stratify these folks to define what their natural history and outcomes will be, we will be challenged in trying to tailor a one-size-fits-all approach to the treatment, not only of NASH, but of, of cirrhosis. I'm hopeful that our understanding of genomics, genetics, and integrative omics approaches can not only define who needs treatment because they will progress, Number two, define potential treatment responses. But number three, also call out in advance the natural history of the course that they will have such that we can monitor patients in a more tailored approach. We know in advance who's likely to develop the cancer and we surveil them differently than we anticipate patients who will develop different clinical outcomes. And with that knowledge, I think we will move in a more cost-effective therapeutic strategy as well as preventative strategy. We're not there yet. We still treat all patients irrespective of their risk and irrespective of their drivers and irrespective of their genomic profiling the same. With that, we are insensitive. We miss 
cancers. We are surprised with natural histories for those that don't progress and we anticipated could and, and those that do when we anticipate it wouldn't. So the measures we have currently, whether they're imaging or liver chemistries or markers of liver synthetic reserve are not as precise as we need them to be. And I am excited about the forefront of precision medicine coming into the landscape of liver disease such that we can stratify patients precisely on many different fronts. Louise, you have a question? No, I have a question because my brain was going on that tangent uh, on precision medicine because I did a couple of the sessions at the recent AASLD meeting and it was very much on HCC and picking the right people for HCC. What if we take all of the cl- current clinical studies in cirrhosis, in any liver disease format, they all store samples, for example. What is different that would, in a sample collection that would require for proteinomics? If everybody combined their entire cirrhosis portfolios together and took a sample and did a, a mass study on all of the cirrhotics for this precision medicine, rather than re-recruit, what would be the obstacles? Because I'm just thinking that the recent Lancet Commission suggested even in viral hepatitis, the delay of COVID could mean an extra 45,000 HCCs and more than that, new people with cirrhosis. We obviously, Stephen's studies also showed that although numbers didn't necessarily increase, the amount of cirrhotics and decompensated cirrhotics did between the two cohorts 10 years apart. So action now to be able to pick out and combine that resource that is massive when we look at all of those studies that we've got in whether it's alcohol, whether it's NASH, uh, whether it's hep C, whether it's so that we can look at those. What would be required? Would it be an extra sample? Is, is there anything that they're saving that we couldn't, that we would need extra to make it more complicated? Well, Louise, I, I think we're getting there. We have you know, the Nimble Consortium. We have the Litmus Consortium. We have now data from the Million Veterans Projects. We have certainly ample ongoing clinical studies. And assuming we can overcome the logistics of data sharing and material management across different sponsors and with initiatives that there is ample opportunity. And I think we are seeing far more robustly powered data in this regard from these large consortia. So I am very encouraged that we are going to get there. I think one very telling story that unfolded in this past year with our promising compounds for the treatment of NAFL to NASH is the many missed primary endpoints. A few that gave you pause, particularly, for example, Alda Furman or Begpal Furman or, or others that, that have failed to achieve an endpoint where all least accumulated preclinical and clinical data would otherwise have informed such an endpoint having been achieved. And a message out there, I'm hopeful that we can shelf some of these compounds as opposed to pitch them. Because when the promising therapies have an effect on liver biochemistry and quantitative liver fat and liver stiffness and surrogate markers of fibrogenesis and drop pro C3 and every marker that you could think to inform fat, necroinflammation, and even fibrosis, we see the needle moving in a positive direction and yet miss the endpoint on histology. And we call this a failed study. I suspect we'll come full circle and hopefully be reevaluating these compounds in an era where the field has moved forward enough that our endpoints have either changed or are more sensitive or the precision medicine field can define which cohort of patients is going to respond most effectively to what drug target. And I certainly hope that the message resonates that we've probably studied some very effective therapies for the treatment of NASH, but applied them to a very heterogeneous cohort of patients and blunted a treatment response that was there given the sample sizes, or the endpoints which we've utilized to measure a treatment response were so crude or insensitive that the response was there, but we could not observe it with the endpoints we used to measure it and therefore called it a failed trial. So for those compounds that have significant promise, validity scientifically, and evidence to have worked on other surrogates, I'm 
I'm hopeful we will shelf them as opposed to trash them such that we can look at them in combination approaches or re- repeat some of the studies using different endpoints and different technologies to inform a treatment response in the future. So it's interesting. You mentioned aldefermin and pegbelfermin as two examples of what you're talking about. And I think it's clear, if you think about the aldefermin trial, right, histology read missed on one of the dose levels and everything else aligned. Pegbelfermin, it didn't necessarily look like anything held value out to 48 weeks. So it's easy to figure out why you would have belief in the first. Right. Harder to figure out why you'd have belief in the second. So what are you thinking there? Or are you well, just... I, I think when I when I use Peg Belfermin as an example, I think of it as a class. We talk about FGF21, and it speaks to the fact that not all drugs are created equally, even within class. When we talk about a target such as FGF21 or FGF19, pegylation and target engagement, bioavailability, distribution, autoantibodies that may or may not develop and how those impact treatments, we should be evaluating each drug, not as a class, but as an individual standalone therapy and its effectiveness. So because one one therapy may not have worked within class does not necessarily mean that every drug within class may be not as effective. Within the FGF21 uh, class, we have a Frexafermin, for example, that shows some potent efficacy. We have different therapies within the FXR class that show hold promise. We're seeing many therapies within the GLP-1 receptor class. So the nice part about the field is there are many potential targets within the same class, many compounds, I should say, to engage the target within the same class. So what will be interesting is to see how they individually perform as a compound within a class, because ultimately, as we saw with the diabetes or with other therapies, even statins, you may have multiple different agents within a class, but different efficacies, different tolerability profiles, and maybe different patients who, who are in need of a therapy or, or a drug target that will respond or tolerate a certain drug better than another. So how many statins do we need on the market? We have several, but yet they are tailored in their prescribing and their effect and their tolerance to certain patients. And I think the same story is going to unfold. You're talking to somebody who bombed Pravacol on liver enzymes, stayed away from statins for 10 years as a result, and then came back to resuvastatin and did really well. So I am the case that makes your point, actually, on this one. I think that sounds exactly right. Louise, go ahead. No, I agree with everything Manal says, and I'm repeatedly saying exactly the same. It's stabilization is a, an endpoint. If um, Donna would be key on this and any of the patient advocates that have had um, disease, they don't want to progress. They're happy to stay stable and well if we can keep you stable and well and I think Manal did an excellent session on what toys in the armory for medications that you've got with your diabetic populations what you've you've got currently that you can use in primary care or specialist care to keep people stable because we do cirrhosis episodes and they're often the top ones we could even do cirrhosis tsunami because that is coming with the amount of diagnosis late and it needs to be addressed and Manal's completely correct from a patient advocacy point of view, from anything, one of the reasons that I left the NHS was to try and enable early diagnosis in a more routine, cost-effective, high-volume way because it's the only way to see it. I got to the end of watching people die young of a disease that we can screen for, we can educate about, and parents miss their children going up. People miss their daughter's weddings or their children's weddings or the birth of their first grandchild. These things are avoidable in the majority of liver health. With COVID really, really delaying diagnosis, people into hospital, picking out vulnerable communities and metabolic disease, of which this is one of them, the Lancet Commission lays it out very stark as to what is happening and what could be happening and what will happen. And we're not in a position to turn turn it around without large scale location of disease. And I think so Manal's perfect. We've got to keep the cirrhotics we've got stable because we've got more cirrhotics coming and we need to be able to stabilize those as early as possible. But we also need to find pre-cirrhotic, so Ishak 5, 4, 3, so things like that to locate these people earlier. But we also need to get them to ask the question and say, check my liver, please. Along what Louise is saying, when we take a look at the timeline to a potential drug that's going to be approved for NASH, we have obiticolic acid currently under FDA review, and we have risimeteron, aramacol, 
and others kind of in in you know phase three now. But but the earliest that I foresee any drug approval really being broadly embraced or utilized in post post approval is really on a horizon in my scope at the earliest of two to five years, two being the very earliest, but probably even a little bit pushed beyond that. When you talk about the integration with third-party payers and distribution and prescribing and so forth. In the meantime, we really must empower our primary care physicians and non-hepatology colleagues in this space with knowledge, with the tools for risk stratification, and with treatment algorithms that may temporize disease progression such that we can do a service now pending an approval of a drug. I've been in this space since the first trials were done and and I'm still talking about a treatment becoming available for the therapy of NAFLD and NASH 23 years later. So I think we must mobilize in the spirit of patient advocacy, rendering the general practitioner, the community physician, the family doctor, the endocrinologist, the obesity specialist, the knowledge, the tools, and the comfort by which to treat each and every metabolic risk factor, knowledge of what the clinical data would otherwise say about minimizing metabolic risk, about weight loss, about treatment of lipids, about improvement of glycemic control, about management of sleep apnea, about comfort and ease with prescribing statins despite the presence of elevated liver enzymes in patients with NAFLD and NASH. We still have a lot of work on that front that needs to be done. And so at least for the, the largest population who is not yet seeing a hepatologist, doctors have an algorithm and a comfort by which they can utilize existing tools and therapies at their disposal. Well, let me tell our guests that we didn't tee you up for that answer because on this episode, the conversation that's going to follow ours is the one with Ken Cousy about the broad action statement of clinical care pathway developments this year, exactly what you're talking about. Perfect. So I just think that, that, yeah, I think so. I think so. So one of the questions I was going to ask Ken, which I will ask you as well, is they say a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. And in a country where um, last I heard, and this was a three, four months ago, but that has changed much. The average endocrinologist was prescribing the NASH-specific tests at a rate far lower than you would predict based on how much AST and ALT they ask for. If that's endocrinology, and that's a lot closer to us than primary care is, what are the first couple of steps that you foresee that will take people with busy 15-minute visits that can't cram anything else into and get them to cram something else into it? How do you see, that in practical terms, how does that work? How do, we, how do we start that process? That's a really challenging question. One that even I struggle to overcome as a hepatologist. How do you see really sick liver disease patients in a 20-minute return slot and feel that you've, you've not missed anything? And I can imagine that it's even more challenging for an endocrinologist who's dealing with multi-system organ disease in the context of diabetes, the eyes, the heart, the nerves, the small vessels, the the kidneys, and now we're throwing into the picture the, the liver. One way to overcome that is changes in the way we see patients, and that doesn't always fall in the um, oversight of physicians. It requires bigger entities, hospital administration, correction of payer mix a lot of time to see patients, or maybe the development of integrated multidisciplinary clinics such that the patient, while they may see a provider, also in one-step shopping has the opportunity to see the nutritionist, the weight loss specialist, the diabetologist, the you know bariatric surgeon, the exercise physiologist. And while time constraints may be not conducive for any one provider, the culmination of contact on many different fronts with any unique individual renders the same uh, delivery of integrated healthcare. Ken Kusi, I, I think very highly of him. He is one uh, of the few endocrinologists in my belief who's turned himself into an endocrine hepatologist and bridging the endocrine complications of liver disease. And really, Ken has a huge mission ahead of himself because we need more of him in our integrated care models. And we have to bring as many metabolic specialists to the, the comfort level of embracing the element of liver disease in the paradigm of metabolic complications and feeling comfortable in doing so. And at the same time, we need to do the same on the front of hepatologists such that they are comfortable, confident, and capable of of 
understanding all the complex elements of metabolism and endocrinology such that we can partner effectively in the care of our patients. I've been asking myself, where the motivator, what is the motivator that unlocks the first key? Because I think, as you say, it's a, it's, it's a problem all over the health system. But patient advocacy is, I think, becoming increasingly powerful. But beyond that, we need a key that will be salient enough that it will unlock and get people to focus on the scope of the problem in a way that they can do something about it. Uh, we hear a few of those. If uh, cirrhosis is increasing at 10 to 12 percent a year in most of the advanced economies right now, and probably more than that in some of the less developed economies, that means you're going to have a doubling of cirrhosis cases in six years or less, depending upon where you are. On the one hand, that's a huge motivator. And, and we need to help our physicians who are non-hepatologists recognize and be able to identify those patients with cirrhosis. You know, many when I speak and I say just if that platelet count is under 150, there's a high probability that that patient may have cirrhosis. You know, eyes open up and ears pop open and saying, wow, you know, we, we, we didn't look, we didn't think to look at those nuances. It may be commonplace for a hepatologist, but I don't think it's commonplace to be looking at the nuances of a platelet count in primary care and linking that with metabolic risk factors or identifying that with a risk stratifier or integrating that with a VCTE or a Fib4 and knowing that a priori, I've identified cirrhosis and I need to refer that patient because this is an individual at higher risk. And we can't ask to turn every provider out there into a hepatologist, but we really need to get the messaging and the tools by which they need so they can, with confidence, risk stratify patients as they see them. They're seeing the brunt of the population. And we as hepatologists want to see those at highest risk and at highest need, highest risk because they already have cirrhosis or are concerned for an impending complication and highest need because they need access to potentially new therapies that are in the pipeline for the treatment of NASH related hepatic fibrosis or cirrhosis. This is all happening in baby steps. Certainly where we are today is nowhere close to where we were five to 10 years ago. And so we should be encouraged as science and genomics and genetics moves forward, our pace with discovery is going to increase. And our ability to define and develop new therapeutic compounds uh, will only be heightened. So the question is, which one's going to hit the, uh, the the golden pot first? Okay, I have one thought, which is kind of a question, then Louise, take a question, and then we'll wrap. So Manal, I think all that's right. But you, more than anyone else who's been on this podcast this year, you and Jeff Lazarus in very different ways, have impressed me with the urgency of today. Okay. So I start asking myself in advance of those drugs, which as you point out, are probably two to five years away, where do we go? And listening to the comment you just made about platelets is really interesting. I think it was with you on podcast, we have this conversation that the big mover on statins back in the eighties and early nineties was when the reference labs were persuaded not to use two standard deviation from the mean to decide what was outside the boundary, but simply arbitrarily set a top level at 300 on total cholesterol, a point in time when a third of the population had a total cholesterol over 300. So all of a sudden doctors keep getting back to these red marks on the lab reports. You could do the same thing with platelets over 150,000, and then you could simply link that to educational materials, and immediately that would make everybody pay attention. The challenge with with doing it just with platelet count is that it almost becomes a volume overload. We want to be precise in, in how we do it such that there's no element of the fatigue factor in there. So we, we talk about, you know, 25 to 30 percent of the U.S. population having NAFLD, but what one to two percent have cirrhosis or what 6% have really bad significant NASH because if I was a primary care provider and I kept getting alerted with every time a crude measurement popped up, I would probably turn off the function or ask for it to be turned off because I was getting too much volume overload and didn't have the time to deal with it. So we, we have to be a little bit more precise. It could be Fib4, but it might be Fib4 with other um, uh, metabolic risk factors. Whatever it is, it certainly is better than nothing, but it has to be precise and it has to be accurate enough that the yield of the alert and its integration into the electronic medical record is more often fruitful than a negative evaluation. We have to be really, really good with our negative predictive value and our positive predictive value. And we are getting there with other modeling of disease. But the reason for, I think some of the, I don't want to say dissatisfaction, but some of the angst here is, is we really do have a therapeutic 
therapeutic landscape moving in parallel with a diagnostic landscape, which is moving in parallel with a population-based screening and surveillance and, and education. And ultimately, these parallel roads will converge and we'll look back and say it all came together at a perfect moment in time and and look what we accomplished. I'm delighted they are moving in parallel, that they're not like moving in synchrony, but because they're not completely and perfectly intersecting to culminate into the, the perfect treatment and diagnostic paradigm, it looks like we are, you know, not synchronously developing or aligning all the parts, but in fact, it will come and it may come in in, in much shorter order than we anticipated because I think we're getting there. Okay, Louise, why don't you take last question and then uh, Manal gets the last statement and then we go on with our day. Manal, do you think it's one of those areas that we need to strengthen primary care? They hold the power. They hold all of the people that we will get referred, the one, two percent. I'm always struck by, there's a fable over here that we get told in schools. It's about Holland and it's about the dam breaking. There's a hole in the dam and there's a boy who sticks his finger in the hole in the dam and saves Holland from flooding because it seals. Is it a case of, yes, we need to keep stability while we strengthen the core to have advanced practitioners, strengthen primary care? Because most of the disease is not going to hit a hepatologist. Some of it's going to hit an endocrinologist. Some of it's going to hit a lot. The AGA's recommendations and Ken Cousy's work is absolutely instrumental in strengthening primary care. But is that where we could get the best investment and return by taking people off the pathway? By Because primary care themselves will be overwhelmed if we were to look at everybody. So maybe a new metabolic assessment that's liver, endocrine, that encompasses the majority. Yes, platelets is great, but we still get a lot of referrals from hematologists who have with cirrhotic patients with low platelets. And we are filling those holes. You know, we, we had the, the launch and approval of ELF here in, uh, in August of this past year. In 2021, we're going to see a new guidance from the ASLD uh, practice guidelines on, on the treatment of NAFLD and NASH, which then will broadly inform both the diagnostic and the therapeutic approaches within our current standard of care. We are seeing care pathways becoming developed and published and proposed and presented. So all of this is happening. We are filling the holes and it's happening on many different fronts, both with approval of diagnostics that will inform a clinically meaningful endpoint, with uh, algorithms and care pathways, with risk stratifying risk predictors and integrating them into the electronic medical record for primary care alerting with education that is happening on many different fronts. And I was asked to present at the Obesity Society meeting in the past year or two, and I welcomed that. Endocrinology, we're seeing more and more presence of fatty liver disease being presented at endocrine society meetings, guidances with our endocrinology colleagues bringing on to the forefront. And Ken Cousy can speak more to this and what he's done in this past year. And certainly we will see care pathways in publication and distribution to primary care and non-hepatologists. So with this, I think we're going to see continued momentum in 2022 and beyond. And I'm excited that certainly we are going to see even more deliberation around endpoints, more engagement with regulatory authorities on how we interpret such endpoints, and potentially even a more holistic approach to uh, the evaluation, not of histology alone, but the compilation of data that informs clinically meaningful outcomes. I think, and we should look back on this past year or two, pat ourselves on the back and say, job well done. We have had not only academia, but industry and the FDA and EMA and entities such as the Liver Forum and NASHTAG and even the National Tsunami and aligned in the greater mission of improving the health and wellness of patients with fatty liver disease, the Global Liver Institute. So when when you have many different forces on many different fronts tackling many different avenues um, from their vantage points, the NASH Alliance, the, the NASH Coalition, and I could go on and on, both here in the U.S., Canada, and Europe, there is no doubt we are going to see incremental change. And while it appears that we're taking baby steps, these baby steps are becoming more adult. They're going to be gigantic. And, you know, it's hard when there's one person working in one space and, and or a handful of people as it was 25 
five years ago, but now we have forces behind this disease that are aligned with making incremental change from our own vantage point and really, I think, collaborating incredibly well together to improve the health and wellness of a huge population at risk. I mean, now, I think that's a fantastic last word for this conversation. So, and a great place to stop. So, thanks for joining us this morning. And you're going to get a note from me later today asking if you want to get up early one day at NASHTAG and uh, join a NASHTAG panel, which hopefully I'll be able to persuade you to do despite the ungodly hour we're asking people to be there for. If not, I'm sure I will see you in Deer Valley, assuming that Omicron doesn't persuade all of us not to go. And have a great holiday and a happy new year, okay? And thanks so much for everything you've done this year. Oh, thank you. You have a, a wonderful holiday and a happy new year to all. And now, back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. And please join me again tomorrow, December 29th, for our conversation with Ken Cousy. Mm-hmm.